ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, Mr. Anthony Scaramucci, and the founder of S4 Capital, Sir Martin Sorrell. Okay, Anthony, we have 20 minutes to talk about 2020. And 2020 is not just the American election. We'll, we'll move on to other things. But let's start with the election. Who'll win? Who'll win in November? Well, you know, I have the, I have the outlying prediction that we technically still don't know who the candidates are. So right. uh, uh, the, I think the consensus view is that um, the president will make it to the nomination, and he'll be the Republican candidate. Right. And then I think it's still very unclear on the Democratic side. Um, but if the president doesn't make it to the nomination for the varying reasons and the trouble that he's facing right now, uh, I think the Republican will very handily win uh, versus the uh, sort of the left-leaning politicians on the uh, Democratic well, side. let's assume for a minute on, on impeachment, the chances are low on impeachment. I mean, from my perspective, it doesn't seem as though well, he will be impeached. Well, I, I, I think if you look at the current facts that have unfolded, I think yeah. that that is the conventional view, and I think most people will accept that. But if the facts worsen, um, and I think one of the issues will be, um, you know, the, the president's been president now for three years. Um, is, is that the only call that he had that had that sort of substance to it. Right. So if the answer to that is yes, then I agree. I think that he will likely not be impeached. But if the answer to that is no, and there's more volume, right. um, I think it's going to be more concerning. To well, people. let's assume he isn't impeached for a minute. And let's say he goes to the polls. Let's look on the Democrat side, because my view is he will win against any or all of the Democrat can candidates that we're seeing at the moment. I'm subject to anybody else emerging. I mean, we were talking off stage about the, the, the slight possibility that Hillary Clinton might mm -hmm. emerge again. Low probability, but yeah. it's a possibility. Yeah. But given the, the slate that we see, uh, who do you think could defeat Trump in the election? Well, I think, I think, I think something more likely would be uh, uh, if, if Vice President Biden continues to weaken, I think somebody more likely would potentially be uh, Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, he's already suggested it to people, and he would be more likely. Uh, Secretary Clinton clearly would love to get in the race. That's just my opinion, based right. on you know, knowing but people around But these are low her. probabilities. We know yes. Michael reasonably exactly well. Right. We know, yeah. you know Hillary Clinton well. Yeah, I would say those are low probabilities. And so I think the race is going to be fought out primarily between Senator Warren and Vice President Biden. Okay. And, so but I'm on, I'm on the outlier view on that as well, because her polling numbers are really good. Yeah. But I think he wins it, and I think it's very similar to what happened in uh, 2003. So you think Iowa and New Hampshire, those figures that we've got in the last few days? Yeah, so, so five weeks before the uh, 2004 Iowa caucus, right. uh, uh, John Kerry was down about 11 points. Right. And he closed that gap, and he won in Iowa, and then he rolled into New Hampshire. And by the end of the South Carolina primary, he was the nominee. And so, so there's, a, you know, there's a weird thing that happens in Democratic uh, Party politics. I think right. sometimes the... Uh, who the consensus person looks like in the beginning ultimately ends up getting the nomination. What do you think, Morton? I think Trump wins, uh, given the current slate, whether it was against Warren. I think Trump would win far more easily than against Biden, but I think Trump wins. Um, what's interesting to my mind is that a lot of what we talk about is because we live in the bubble. So I live in London and New York. You live on the East Coast. West Coast. Now, interestingly, yeah. your business, you have a lot of retail investors, uh, yeah, so, so you see the Midwest and the middle, and so you say that that's, that's shifting. I, I think the president would have to be very worried, uh, because the middle of the country, uh, which is his proverbial base, is shrinking. Uh, and they did some polling numbers yesterday about the impeachment, right. and it looked like the hardcore people were at about 26 percent. He has been roughly flat in terms of his approval rating. Uh, some of that's good news, some of that's bad news for the president, but he's been stuck in the real clear politics zone of about 41 percent. But when you ask these people if there was an alternative, 60 percent of the Republicans say yes, they would be open to a right. potential primary. Uh, right. So to me, when I travel in the Midwest, you know, Chicago, Ohio, some of the swing states, uh, there is uh, worries. I think the, the content 
is mixed. You know, he hasn't done super well for the farmers. He hasn't done super well in the manufacturing communities. Some of it's not his fault, frankly, but some of it, you know, is just the uh, forces of globalism and so well, forth. So but I think I, they're worried. Yeah, so I, I, I think the key factor will be turnout. I mean, one of the interesting things about the U.S. presidential election last time round, and about Brexit, about the referendum, is the turnouts were roughly two-thirds of the electorate. So what effectively it means that in the case of Trump, a third approximately the electorate voted for him, a third voted for Clinton, and a third didn't, didn't turn up. Brexit was very similar. It was about a 70% turnout. And it, as you know, it was 52-48, which effectively means a third of the country voted out a third voted to remain, and a third didn't bother to turn out. So if there is a higher turnout, which there may be, we'll see, we'll see as we, although there's a lot of apathy in relation to po politics in Western countries, um, that might be, to my mind, the, de the deciding factor. If the turnout was very high, probability gets less. So we spent a few, go ahead. No, no, I was just going right. to so, so turnout's high, you think it's more likely that the Democrats would yeah, be successful. Be, be, because of the margin, right? Yes. I mean, you have to remember that the, the president... She had more of the popular vote. Where I would give the president credit, he's done a great job of convincing the Republicans in his caucus that he had this resounding landslide victory. But if you really look at the victory, it was uh, several hundred thousand votes in about four or five states that decided yeah. the election. And remember, he lost the popular vote by about yeah. three and a half million votes. Okay. So the title of our little snapshot is 2020 Who Wins? And you can broaden that beyond just the US presidential election. And let's sort of broaden the discussion a bit because the biggest issue that worries me, uh, and we've, you know, we started a digital business a year or so ago, it's expanding rapidly and internationally. We're already in 25, 26 countries. And the biggest issue that I worry about, and I think from a commercial and business point of view is the biggest troubling issue for anybody who runs any multinational company is US-China relations. To my mind, that is the number one issue. It's the inability, I think, of America to accept or of the powers that be to accept, and this is not just a Republican phenomenon, uh, US-China relations I don't think would be much better whether Bernie Sanders was there or Elizabeth Warren was there. Maybe with Biden it would be slightly different, it would be more constructive. But I, my sense is America is, um, or again, the powers that be in America are concerned about the rise of China and are still not willing to accept that. What do you, what do you think well, about well, that? Yeah, but let me, let me ask you this question. I think this is, do you think when you look at the, let's call it 1979 to today, yeah. uh, Deng Xiaoping to today, yeah. Uh, and you look at the growth of China, its trajectory, and its trading relationship with America, do you think that some things needed to be redressed by America, yes or no? Well, the, 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 the level playing field, I'm, you know, sit on the Business Council, for example, in America for a number of years, under President Obama and now under President Trump. And I think, you know, if you look at that community of 100 or so chief executives, they were, were very much of the opinion that the president was right to address the level playing field issues in China. Yep. Our business advertising and marketing at WPP, we built a business of 16, 17,000 people there with 20% market share. Never really had any significant interest, maybe on media measurement we had one issue, but we resolved that pretty quickly with CCTV, the state broadcasting, the number one state broadcasting company. So I would say we found it constructive over the 30 years or so that we built the business, very constructive in an environment that we could operate very successfully in. So we didn't have a problem. Now that wasn't the case, if I can put it, for people in real business as opposed to show business, which we're in. So in real business, the level playing field was a, was a problem. So they backed him on that. And I think today they would still be in agreement. They would still back him but less strongly, because it started to hit, as we've seen, GDP, global GDP has been affected, it has been softened, probably at the margin for the moment, but it could get worse, by the trade war. I mean, the trade war is, I think, a symptom of the problem. I think it will get resolved pr prior to the election, not totally, but they'll, they'll come to some deal, but it doesn't deal with the fundamental issue. Ray Dalio, who I think was here, uh, 
in the early part of this conference, uh, has a wonderful slide about the rise and fall of reserve currencies. It goes back to the Dutch florin, rising and falling. The British pound, rising and falling. The American dollar, rising and a bit on the decline. And the rise of the RMB. Interestingly, go back 200 or 300 years, the early 19th century, the RMB was at a peak. People forget yeah, well, that China 200 years ago was the largest economy. But, but, but I think our issue, a lot of people that worked for the president, the issue really was not the redress and not making the playing field more symmetrical, but the issue was how to do it. And one of the recommendations uh, early, uh, back in December of 2016, was to move more predictably. And yeah. so uh, if you needed to move tariffs by 20%, you could have done that 2% per quarter. And in two and a half years, you would have gotten to the symmetry that you were looking for. And then you would have given business leaders, large and small around the world, the opportunity to adjust their supply chain. And so one of the negatives of the way this thing has been deployed is that there's been a lot of uh, unpredict unpredictability, unpredictability in terms of how uh, we think about this. And then I think, you know, frankly, the president made a mistake by in the middle of the trade war with the Chinese, then arbitrarily saying that he was going to put a 5% tariff on the Mexican economy uh, because of what was going on at the border. But the orig origination of that was the that the Americans thought they had a deal, and then the Chinese negotiators went back and reportedly President Xi changed, either changed his mind or felt that his negotiators took too, too malleable so position. I, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that, but you had the opportunity starting in January 2017 yeah. to say, okay, listen, we're going to start moving our tariffs gradually. We don't yeah. need to jam them up to where they are now. Yeah. Uh, and if you just look at investment capital data in the United States over the last two quarters, and now the third quarter capital data, uh, it's non-existent. I think a lot of that is from the lack of predictability. And so in a weird way, business leaders on that business council would complain about President Obama saying that he was overregulated, uh, and so they were slowing down their yeah, investment growth. It, it was different. I, I mean, They're this, doing the same thing with the president. Yeah, but this comes to another point. I mean, the, the withdrawal of America from the rest of the world, or the, which really started under President Obama, um, in my mind, the, the sort of slight retrenchment which is accelerated under President Trump. I mean, we've seen what's happened in Syria recently. Mm -hmm. That withdrawal has created a vacuum which China is filling, which Russia is filling, and which other countries will fill in due course. Yes, I, so the, I, the I, think that's under, I think that's unfortunate for the world. And I, and I think there are many of us in America that don't believe in American absenteeism. I think the, I think the, the, the message is, is that uh, America, particularly at this time, and I know we're going to get to populism yeah. and a few other issues, but America at this time needs to be more engaged with the world and not less. And I think one of the issues is because of the rise of populism and the rise of nationalism, uh, political leadership that wants to pulse that mm. and get that support is arguing for disengagement. But states, men and women, uh, that really see the world and the structure of the world uh, and the forward progress that we can all make together, we see it very differently. Uh, the, does the American regime believe, do the Republicans in particular believe that in Chinese military expansion? Because historically that has not been the case beyond their own borders or what they regard as their own borders. They don't historically expand I, to a significant degree, but I, there seems to be this, this fear, neurosis. I think it's more of an economic, I think it, the in soft, their minds, the yes, soft it's power. a soft power war. It's more of an economic war. It's more of a positioning war on things like rare earth materials. And it's, uh, I think that the, the one belt, one road initiative is not fully understood. And I think what people have to recognize, I'm sure most of the people in this room recognize that uh, a lot of the people in the Congress don't travel. Uh, they, they, their, their idea of getting a passport is to visit Mexico or go up to Canada. And so there's a myopic idea about what's going on. And so a result of that, there's a touch of xenophobia and there's a, it, there's a touch of fear. Uh, having said all that, um, if they don't resolve, if we don't resolve collectively the crisis of wealth distribution and the attribution of profit in the society, uh, there's a real strain in the okay, society. Okay, so right let's say just but finally on that on that issue, I'm covering, trying to cover it in a couple of minutes. The paradox about what you just said is, as America withdraws, that gives the opportunity to fill the vacuum. So what we see in Africa, we've just had presidents of Africa on the stage. What we see in Latin America, uh, where sort of gradual withdrawal, and I just want to pick up on one other mm -hmm. point you said about President Obama. I, I don't think President Obama, rather like uh, Prime Minister May, 
uh, in the UK really like business. I mean, I don't think they felt comfortable dealing with the business, both of them. Uh, they felt that any business person they had interacted with had an agenda and therefore yeah. contact or involvement. I think, with them. I think that's fair. One thing about President Trump is the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he totally understands it uh, and tries to em embrace it. But the paradox is, as America withdraws, the vacuum is filled in Latin America and Africa. So let's turn to populism. Well, let me just say 30 yeah. seconds on this. I think it's important. I was in, in, I was in Iraq in 2011, January, right at the beginning of the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the general in charge there, basically, he took out the, the book, The Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes, and he opened up to a quote, and I'll paraphrase the quote, but he basically said that the world has its greatest peace and prosperity when there is one hegemon mm -hmm. suppressing the internecine conflict in the world, Pax Romana, Pax yeah. Britannia. And the point that he was making is that the United States tried to set up their military strategy post-World War II to do that. Uh, and, and if you look at the architecture, all that post-World War II architecture, plus the American military, we have more or less collectively as a globe done a good job of that. American disengagement at a time where there isn't a clear military leader, and it's also not clear that that military leader is, you know, has the checks and balances in the system that the United States has, I think that's worrisome to the world. I think that will add risk premium to markets, and I think it will also potentially create unwanted crisis or unwanted conflict. Okay. As we do this global dash, let's just turn to what you mentioned briefly before, populism. Uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing disturbances. I've got a list here. Hong Kong, Chile, Ecuador, Bolivia, Egypt, Lebanon, Iraq, Spain, uh, Indonesia. All disruption, populist-driven disruption, even in very st what we think of as stable regimes like Chile, for example, probably to, to a negative, a, a most stable historically worried about intervention of the army, which probably drove a lot of the unrest in the case of Santiago and Chile just recently. Um, but obviously populist tendencies, and, and coming back to the first thing that we discussed, the election, that's the primary driver for President Trump. This is the disenfranchised or the disaffected yeah. or the people who feel they've been left behind. And you, know, you saw that in the White House. So, that drive is not going to go away. That's going to intensify. We're at the beginnings, really, not foothills, but really the beginnings of technological development and the pace is quickening. So those people are going to feel even more disenfranchised and worried. So now I've you know, studied this as an economist over 30 years, uh, and you can go back 150 years in America, and you can look at the profit attribution between labor and capital. When it's 50-50, Mm -hmm. The society and the Zika society is very happy. When it rotates more towards capital versus labor, you get these sort of anxiety moments. Uh, it took place during the robber baron era. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt tried to correct it. Franklin Roosevelt tried to correct it. And so we're there in the same way that you are in Great Britain. And so one of the things I'm super worried about is the politicians are pulsing out the nationalism and they're creating the fervor to get the vote, but they're not really addressing the policies that we need to fix it. And I would like those policies to be market-based, and I'd like good tax policy to be related to capitalism. If they don't do that... So what would you do? I, and if they don't do that, I fear that we're going to lurch... Well, what specifically uh, would you do? We've had some... We've had some... The, well, the many... Warren Sanders camp recommending wealth taxes. No, yeah. that was tried in the UK. I mean, people... Yeah. No, there was that, a French economist on CNBC I think talking on, about I don't think that no would European work. country. I mean, just remind people that under the Labour government in the UK, uh, in the 60s, 70s, earned income was taxed at 83 percent, unearned at 98 percent. They introduced a wealth tax, would have taken unearned income or capital up to 103 well, percent. Look, I think those things are unsustainable. But I think what ends up happening is if we don't fix the problems from a capitalist perspective, so three things the government can do. Uh, number one, they could change the earned income tax credit at the low end, uh, which will give more cash to the lower income people. Number two, and we had this idea, uh, we were going to re, uh, offer a repatriation of uh, capital offshore for companies like Apple and Google, et cetera, and you could create an Which infrastructure. Which happened partially, that's happened. Yeah, but you could create an infrastructure bank. Yeah. You could say to Apple, move $50 billion into the infrastructure bank, and then you could begin the process of infrastructure development off the balance sheet of right. the U.S. And then obviously the third thing is tax policy. There's, mm -hmm. there, there, there were incentives that we could put in place for technical training. Uh, we could give a company like yours H or other higher companies. Higher income tax? 
uh, potentially higher income tax, but sort of like a Clinton-esque income tax. Remember, the United States printed a budget surplus in 2000. We had a $234 billion surplus in 2000. We squandered that with the wars yep. and the tax cuts. Um, and so you don't have to make the taxes ridiculous, but if you had Clinton-style taxes, uh, you could match some of the services the government's providing without all this deficit. And step-ups for capital gains? Uh, I don't, I, I don't, I, I'm not a big believer in that. Yep. I think we're going in that direction one way or the other, yep. but I think that would be another thing that could happen and not disrupt the capitalist system. Okay, but do, do you think this inequality issue is going to shift markedly with interest rate, global interest rates where they are? I mean, unless interest rates return to what, in our minds, mm -hmm. I'm an older yeah, man. Yeah, three and a half, five year, percent. Yeah. Whatever. How, how is it possible? Because a lot of the inequality has been driven since Lehman by interest rates being lower. And now, in Europe, for example, you, you deposit money with a, with a bank or corporate, you get taxed on it. I understand that. But just think of it this way. If you cut corporate taxes from 35 to 21, that's a 40 percent tax cut in the U.S. Big hike. It dropped, it dropped right to the bottom line of the American corporations. But you didn't really see it in the jobs data. The reason why the wages went up in the U.S., it had to do with the tightening of immigration. Well, the reduction of immigration uh, caused the bottom 10 percent of the wage earners to have a 5 percent wage increase. It's a very complex problem, but the, 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 the thing that I'm worried about is that we need leadership that understands the blue-collar world and that can operate in the, the world of the elites at the same time and make both sides synthesize and calm each other down so they'll be less angry. Okay, so we're out of time. We've yep. done a big global dash, as I said. So finally, some predictions. We didn't get on to Brexit. Yeah. Trump's going to lose. Tr I say Trump wins. What about yeah. the, I, what about the British the election? What's going to happen there? Well, you know better than me, but I, 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 I think wish I still, did. I don't. I think I, I, I still think it would be problematic to have a Brexit, and I think that's why they keep moving the goalposts on it. I so think we'll Prime Minister Johnson probably gets a small majority, might have, but have, will have sufficient maybe to get Brexit through. We'll see what happens. Thank you very much. Okay, God bless. Thank you.